This week on Life and Faith. He would hear on the radio this fire and brimstone preacher kind of thundering about plagues. Things like once in every generation, a plague will fall among them. Like it's such that scary, almost Lord of the Rings style confrontation in terms Mm -hmm. of massive clashes between good and evil. We feel this impulsion to tell our story, to bear witness of the mystery that is us. The Romans took for granted their right to massacre men and to enslave women and children. It's infringing on the concept of human identity. Welcome to Life and Faith from CPX. I'm Simon Smart. I'm Natasha Moore. And I'm Justine Toe. And we're bringing you something a little bit different on Life and Faith today. Now, here at CPX, we all love reading books, streaming shows, watching movies, and thinking about the way all of these offer a kind of a window into our moment. We're especially keen on exploring what these stories suggest we believe about the world, the way they reveal what we think. And we do spend an undisclosed amount of time (laughs) when we're in the office (laughs) debriefing about these things around, you know, uh, this is how we work. We're clustered around a big um, desk in a COVID safe way. (laughs) Um, So we figured why not kind of include our loyal listeners on some of those meandering chats that we have. Yes, absolutely. And just before we press record, we did a straw poll of the people in the room, which is the three of us plus our producer, Al. And we find that we are collectively subscribed to 15 streaming services, which is quite horrifying. <laughs> I'd like to clarify that some of them were free. And <laughs> doesn't like, matter. Not, yeah. My the wife book. doesn't know that all of these, so <laughs> oh, please really? don't tell oh, her. Oh, I get in trouble sometimes. Say, they I pop don't. up on a credit card statement. Oh, no. I'm meant to have stopped that. Right. <laughs> but I think all this means that we have enough content to fill a year's worth of life and faith (laughs) with these chats. But we're not going to promise we'll do that right now. Yeah, but maybe now and then. Let's see how this one goes. Uh, First up, uh, I want to talk to you, Natasha, about a book you've been reading, Priest Daddy. And raving about. (laughs) Yeah. I'm wondering about this, especially that title. Yeah. So uh, this is a memoir by a poet, um, Patricia Lockwood. She's been called the Poet Laureate of Twitter. So she grows up in this... Catholic family. Um, it's called Priest Daddy because it's about her father who is a Catholic priest, which you're like, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. And then you're like, hang on, wait, what? Yes. <laughs> um, because he uh, was a Lutheran minister. I mean, he was an atheist and then converted to Lutheranism and then converted to Roman Catholicism. And if you are already in ministry, you can get a dispensation to be a Catholic priest who isn't... Who's sober, married. Who has a family. Right. Um, and so she grew Not up that. in these, you know, Catholic rectories and um, yeah, her wow. dad is like... <laughs> it's got to be very unusual. Very unusual. I've never heard of it. And then that's almost the least unusual thing about her <laughs> and her family. Like, so, you know, the memoir is kind of set up as... Um, she, like, runs off with this guy she meets online when she's, like, 21 and they get married. Is that um, a good idea? Seems, well, he seems lovely and they, this is, like, 10 years later. Like, their relationship seems wonderful. So then he has some health stuff. They have no money, so they move back in. Um, with priest daddy. With the mum and dad. Um <laughs> Uh, And even though she's no longer a believer um, and they see things very differently, um, lead very different lives, there's also a lot of um, love between them. And I just, like, her writing is so amazing. All I really want to do is, like, read you passages (laughs) to be, like, you need to appreciate. Classic Natasha. Give us something. Okay, so here's one to start with. This is, like, an initial description of her father who is this larger-than-life character. She says... Some men are so larger than life that it's impossible to imagine them days old and diapered. But I've always found it the easiest thing in the world to see my father as a baby, lolling on his back in the middle of fresh sheets, smoking a fat cigar to congratulate himself on his own birth, stubbing out the cigar with great style in the face of his first teddy bear. Oh. Like every passage is like that. Yeah. And he that's, you immediately want to... Hear about this guy. Yeah. So he, she tells the story of how he was kind of this fast living um, teenager and young man and married uh, her mother, who was 
a devout Catholic and who was convinced that he would come around eventually. Mm -hmm. Um, And he actually joined the Navy, was converted on a nuclear submarine (laughs) where they watched The Exorcist over and over. And he was converted (laughs) by watching that and being like, oh, evil is real and you you need to do something. That's that's incredible. And not again... This is sort of unexpected, which obviously is the thing that makes this book so engaging, right? And I think especially the clash between her world, which is so kind of Twitter, progressive, lefty, and whereas her family are very kind of conservative. <laughs> are they? So no, they don't sh- sound it. How does that shake, yeah, shake up? Well, I guess you just get the feeling, and particularly, I suppose, in our um, current climate of you know, extremes and distrust between them, you just get this sense of like, well, they disagree about everything, but they love each other. Mm. And they actually kind of get on really well in lots of ways. So while they're an thinking ideal that community? Crazy. Well, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> perhaps yeah. in some ways, like with all the mess. So, you know, for example, like they hate the New York Times. They think it's like from the devil. But they're really proud of her when she <laughs> publishes in the New York I Times. Because that. that's, that's really, you know, mm. exciting for her. So um, let me read you this passage, which kind of sums up a little bit about what she's dealing with what the experience is like for her. Who's speaking? So this is her describing a conversation with her father. Yep. What are you femmes doing? My father booms from the doorway. He always calls us femmes. It is, believe it or not, a term of affection. <laughs> when he's angry, he calls you a feminazi. When he first encountered that epithet on Rush Limbaugh's radio show in the early 90s, he hugged it to himself as wholeheartedly as a second wife. (laughs) Nuns are feminazis, Democrats are feminazis. The secretary who asks him please not to call her dollface is a feminazi. (laughs) It goes without saying that I am a feminazi. He finds uses for the word in all sorts of situations. If he were alone in the wilderness and a cougar charged him, he could yell feminazi right in its tawny face. And I have no doubt the cougar would back down. (laughs) That's great. You can feel the affection. Yeah, yeah. right? That she's like, you know, if she met a stranger who like called her a feminazi, you'd presumably be like, oh my goodness, this person. Um, But it's her dad and he loves her. and Mm, It's lovely. So he's a pretty strange Catholic. (laughs) <laughs> and she is a lapsed something. She's a lapsed feminazi. <laughs> does she reflect on the fact that their worlds are so different? Is, mm. Does she engage with the religious stuff at all? Yeah, she does loads. I mean, it's kind of a lot of it is sort of an account of um, what a faith community is like from the inside but she's sort of inside and outside. Mm. So it looks crazy to her. She doesn't believe it. But also she has lived in it and she's loved the people in it. And she loves a lot of them now. Like, you know, there are various, um, for part of the book, there's a seminarian who comes and lives with them while they're studying. Um, And this guy is very odd, but she adores him and he, like, has a lot of fun talking to her. And um, all these people sound very strange. (laughs) And a lot of the things that the church does, like, you know, for me, I'm not, Catholic, so some of it I'm like, oh, that's that's so a bit foreign to, to me yeah. as well. But she goes to a Protestant youth group when she's a teenager, and some of that I was like, oh yes, I that's mean, familiar. still sort of American crazy, but like, <laughs> is it <laughs> but, um, um, so, recognizable? So sh- is she expressing? It's obviously very funny, but is she expressing any warmth, not just to the people involved, but to kind of what they stand for? Yeah, I mean, she definitely um, appreciates like what faith is and what it does Mm. uh, for people. And she has, like, there's something kind of missing for her as well. Like, she engages with that quite sincerely and, like, without kind of bitterness or prejudice. Um, And and you can see it, like, in her prose, uh, which is very poetic. She's a poet. But it's also very kind of heavily, like, biblically inflected. I mean, you find this a lot. I have... You know, I have no data on this, but in terms of writers whose parents were devout and Christians of some kind, that you can see the influence of the Bible in the way. So I'll, I'll read you one more. Um, this is her uh, talking towards the end about this uneasy arrangement she's come to where she doesn't agree with what her family stands for, but she is kind of very for them. Mm. Um, she says, a truce then between me and my father's house. 
you could play a game of like Bible reference bingo in this <laughs> passage and a lot of it. I was not made in his likeness, but I have chosen something of his same extremity, his willingness to be available for the questions that knock on the door in the middle of the night. His voice inside the verses was so sweeping, his judgment from the pulpit so black and white that it was hard not to inherit them. It was hard not to inherit the desire to stand over the deceased and say something. And it was impossible, finally, not to inherit his anger. As long as I lived under his roof, I told myself that I had no temper, that I would never speak that knot of heat I felt so often in my throat, forced down into my rib cage, sent flowing into my fingertips. But I belong to myself now, and I can admit it. When I sit down at the desk, the anger radiates out of me in great bronze spikes, like holiness in the old paintings. And a sermon rises up in me as if it had been waiting for breath and puts itself together bone to bone. Mm, some brilliant writing. I love yeah. that. The sermons come bubbling up inside of her. And it, it sounds to me like from that, she's talking about this in a sort of a positive way. That anger that she's inherited from her father is being deployed in perhaps positive directions, is it? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. I think with everything in this um, and in life, it's kind of complicated. So I think one of the things I really loved about this book is just kind of the antics of her family and how she tells them. And that's so delightful. But there's a real seriousness mm. to a lot of it as well, to some of the experiences that she's been through in and out of the church. Um, and also the relationship with her father, You, she kind of reveals towards the end how much she's been filtering and kind of only showing you his like, oh yeah, he's crazy, but also kind of delightful and loves us. But there's, you know, layers of complexity there um, and things that she does resent from him. So it's not kind of all tied up in a neat bow, mm. but you do feel that the engagement with that mess, um, the mess of real relationships with people who don't agree on stuff is really valuable. Um, like the, the engagement is real. They haven't given up on each other. This is Life and Faith, and this week we're talking about books we're reading, podcasts we're listening to, and shows we're watching, like this. <laughs> I'm scared. Me too. Where will we go? Welcome to the Boulder Free Zone. How do you know who I am? How do you think? Mother Abigail? All I know is that we dreamed of her and she was real. She brought us all together keep us safe in these uncertain times. I am in the way of knowing things. I know you feel him. Calls himself the dark man, but mostly I just see his wolf. Mother Abigail told us that there are two sides. There's the good, and then there's a deep well of darkness. must make your stand. <laughs> now, what is that, Justine? <laughs> this is The Stand. So uh, Amazon Prime has made a 10-part series of Stephen King's 1978 novel of the same name. It has been adapted for the TV before, but this is a new updated version. And because it's about... Um, a, a super flu that kind of wipes out 99% of the world's population. Mm -hmm. It's very timely, clearly. <laughs> um, well, sort of, not really. <laughs> anyway, so the survivors of that super flu um, wind up in this climactic kind of battle between good and evil. You've got the survivors who start to have these dreams. They start dreaming of Mother Abigail, who's this kindly, wise, old spiritual woman played by Whoopi Goldberg, who's receiving these messages from God, telling them to come and meet her in her community. And they also start having these dreams where they get menaced by the dark man. Okay, so it's like a not, it turns out he's not like a devil, but he's like a demon. He's, mm. he's like a demon in double denim. You can see. It's a very, very <laughs> vivid look. But this, this character, oh. Randall Flagg, that, that's his name, he appears across various parts of the Stephen King universe. Oh. So he's very much a character. So, Justine, you're a Stephen King fan. This is new uh, well, information to me. I sit there going, like, am I speaking a different language? Because you guys are just looking at me like, oh, blankly. tell me about this thing. <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah. you've read the book. I've read the book. So it was originally 800 words and then Sting, uh, Sting, Stephen King released it. Um, well, he updated it and it was like a thousand words. So it's like a tome. Pages? Mm. A thousand pages, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <not> a <laughs> it was a very concise <laughs> essay. <laughs> um, so it is a world you can get lost in. And it's probably not your kind of literature, Simon. I can tell by the look on your face. But <laughs> well, I, I don't it. really know because I've never read You've a never Stephen read. King book. No. Wow. And okay. I oh. know that lots of people love them when they do, but I've never. Because I had never read Stephen King because I can't watch horror movies. I. Oh, I'm just, not a horror person so either. Unpleasant, yeah. and so I assumed I couldn't read horror either. But then I was once I was at a literature conference, and somebody like sitting next to me at dinner basically told me how wonderful Stephen King was. And I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. So I decided to read Stephen King's book about writing, because oh, yeah. then it's not, well, very, which is famous. excellent. Yeah. And it also talked about his writing of Carrie, particular, particularly oh. his first novel. And I was like, okay, I got to try it. And I realized that, A, I can do horror if it's written. It's different to watching it. And B, Stephen King is a brilliant novelist. Like, Carrie's an amazing novel. Well, I haven't read that, but I think my entry into Stephen King is The Shawshank Redemption. I mean, that was made into a movie. It wasn't originally called that. But, I mean, that's kind of linked to what I'm talking about today, because The Shawshank Redemption and The Stand is kind of, it's quite Christian, but Christian in a very particular kind of way. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Well, okay, so he would describe himself as um, someone who believes in good and evil, very much so. And I think he's really, he's like a God person, but let's just leave it at that in terms <laughs> of his spiritual biography. He's called the stand Dark Christianity. Ooh. And apparently when he was living in Boulder, Colorado, which is where the um, Mother Abigail's community end up living, um, he would hear on the radio this fire and brimstone preacher kind of thundering about plagues, things like, you know, once in every generation, a plague will fall among them. Like wow. it's such that sort of really scary, almost Lord of the Rings style kind of confrontation in terms mm. of massive clashes between good and evil. And he wanted to write an American Lord of the Rings. And so when you're watching this um, adaptation, I am, I was sitting there going, wow, you can see like the gaze of the dark man sort of feels like the gaze of Sauron. So you've mm. got these like little band of survivors or heroes who are trying to take on this like, mammoth evil. And it's really interesting because both those texts as well, they don't, like, it it depends on the heroes playing their part, but the final victory doesn't come about by their efforts. Hmm. In almost, in both of those texts, really strangely, there is an entry from outside, like, I I think it's called the deus ex machina, right? Like, it's like the god crane just reaching down and just fixing the problem all of a sudden, which Hmm. is intensely dissatisfying in, in terms of... Cause we is want it also the, a spoiler alert? Are you, oh, look, it's kind of... been out since 1978. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, and so it's just an interesting thing. So in even though Stephen King is not like a classically Christian kind of author, it's just he, he lives in that universe. He's been shaped by it. It comes out in his work in various ways. Well, Justin, that reminds me, I have a friend who talks about his journey towards Christianity starting by reading... Stephen King novels, and it was all about confronting the reality of evil. Mm. That was how he he describes it, which is sort of plays. Which in oh, is also about. similar to Priest Daddy, yeah. the guy like so, right, the Exorcist, with the Exorcist, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the oh reality of re- which you wouldn't evil think of as kind of yeah, what you'd show things. to invite people to consider. No, <laughs> no, Maybe not. no, Christian faith. You know, and it's a really, I mean, he calls it dark Christianity, this this novel, and you can see that in the way that the, the show's been made. But I have to say, I mean, if I'm supposed to provide some sort of comment about the show itself, that it's a really strange choice. Like, it does seem to fit on, you know, on the, on the surface because of the pandemic, etc. But they haven't really updated King's kind of world for this time. So the Christian references feel so strange and out of place. You know, so, so the good community around Mother Abigail they are literally white picket fences, domesticity. They're trying to build a functioning community. While over in Las Vegas or New Vegas, where the, the dark man reigns, it's like sex, drugs and rock and roll. Mm. And so you look at that and you're there going, what are they doing there? And do they not understand that 
we live in a really different world and you can't like paint good and evil in such stark terms. And, you know, as, and if anyone's like, oh, you know, this is Stephen King saying that sex is evil. And it's like, no, in the novel, the the community that flag the dark man is building is like fascist. It's like you, you if you're doing drugs, you get crucified because you're not on board with the program for order and control. Wow. So this adaptation has bizarre sexual politics <laughs> that people would call liberatory today. And yet that's pinned as being evil in, in, the, yeah. in the show. But, but that's surely very deliberate. I swear it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't anyway. Know. I, I, who's anyway, behind it? I, mean, I, I have no idea. Mm. But I mean, all I can say is that at a, at a big moment of confrontation, it is very strange to see one of your characters from um, Boulder, from the good side, good side in inverted commas, coming into this place and he's about to get killed publicly as a demonstration of power. And he just keeps saying... I will fear no evil, which, mm. if you know it, is yeah. a quote from Psalm 23. It's a very Christian kind of thing. Just over and over again, I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. It's just really bizarre to see that. And it's not like no one's pointing fingers directly at it, but it's there. So I, I have to say, I think the adaptation itself, for me, it misses the mark. But it is really interesting in that it acknowledges that there is that kind of big spiritual dimension to life. And there is a confrontation that we are part of, whether we know it or not, or whether we like it or not. And in light of that, the need to make your stand, as Mother Abigail says. You're listening to Life and Faith from CPX. I'm Simon Smart with Natasha Moore and Justine Toe in the studio. And this is Seen and Heard on Life and Faith. Thus far, we've been talking about Priest Daddy, this book I read and absolutely loved. Um, The Stand, the Amazon Prime series that Justine may not have loved quite as much as <laughs> but still I enjoyed. I love Priest Daddy. Stuff. Found it interesting. <laughs> um, what about you, Simon? What have you been? Mulling doing. over. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm reading lots of things, of course, but I'm going with something I've been listening to. Mm. It's a podcast and it features Bruce Springsteen and Barack Obama. It's called The Renegades, Born in the USA. It's and on sounds Spotify. right up your alley, it's Simon. Right, it is right up my alley. <laughs> and I have to say, it feels like a culture clash talking to you two about Bruce Springsteen. I know something about but... Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> and, I'm glad, but you know. I'll, well, let's see what, what you do know. But look, he's a very important voice in America over five decades. And I, have, I want to say, if you've only ever heard Springsteen or your kind of connection to him is hearing Born in the USA in the background in the supermarket <laughs> or something, or on your dad's preferred radio station, you're missing out. But, you know, irrespective of that, these are both, you know, really fascinating lives. Springsteen, who's kind of working class New Jersey, comes from nothing and becomes this rock star. But he's really a great storyteller, poet and an observer of American uh, history and culture and a commentator on that literature. And he's, he's really an, an interesting guy. And then you've got Obama, the lawyer, politician of mixed race from Hawaii. They're kind of an unlikely Familiar duo. Yep. People <laughs> he's know also who president. He is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the arc of their lives, or at least they see the arc of their lives as kind of having connections. My father was silent most of the time. He was not communicative. I grew up thinking, you know, my father was like ashamed of his family. That was that was my entire picture of, of masculinity. Did you have to deal with that? So my father leaves when I'm two, and I don't meet him until I'm 10 years old when he comes to visit for a month. I had no way to connect to the guy. You know, the guy's, he's a stranger who's suddenly in our house. So hang on, how did this happen? How did they get together? Yeah, they like, what's the idea? Friends. Like, oh. Springsteen loved Obama's politics. Uh, they're closely aligned in that sense. And he started um, playing for you know, various events in 2008 in the lead up to the election. And then they met and then they met again. And then they tell the story in the podcast of how they ended up having all these dinners together and he'd go to the White House and... They'd have nights where he'd be playing the piano and Obama would be singing and they'd be doing all these different <laughs> fun things. And they sort of, yeah, they seem to become actual friends. Oh, nice. And so then they decided to sit down and have a chat and yeah, and you know, it as a podcast. They're, they're both in kind of a reflective mood. Uh, and time the, of their lives. Their, yes, that's the, right. Their lives, but also the state of the country and, mm. and where that's going. So there's an awful lot of reflection on that as they talk. 
Um, you know, they both have this sort of, I don't know, it's a shared sensibility about work, family, America. I've, I've seen the kind of, I do see the connections. I mean, Obama, when I read one of Obama's early books, he describes this um, moment where he's, he gets to New York and he's meant to be staying at his cousin's place and his cousin's not there. And so he has to sort of sleep in the alleyway next to his cousin's Which is quite dangerous, house. I guess, if you're, yeah. if you're a black man, you're, right? You're a black man. Mm-hmm. In yeah. your, and I've often wondered what it would be like to walk past that, to see him sleeping in the alleyway, and then for someone to say that guy will be the president. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's true. There's, so there's something sort of almost a, a bit biblical about that, yeah, a kind really. of like <laughs> seeing the president in the homeless man, yeah. seeing like yeah. and Jesus in the... <laughs> totally. It's, I've always been, I've never forgotten that moment mm. when I read that. And, you know, so they come from sort of humble backgrounds. Springsteen talks about buying his first guitar. He saved up for it and it was 18 bucks and he got home and started to learn basic chords. And then it becomes eventually literally a part of it feels like it's a part of him and he's sort of built this life out of that out of sheer grit basically grit and determination. He's, they are the american dreams and when like. you read about those early days in his, of his bands he's just smashing it out along the shores of new jersey there and doing everything he can to to get somewhere and his his whole vision is sort of the, the escape, you know, it's sort of get out of town. He comes from this funny little town, Freehold, New Jersey. And it, it, his early work was all about busting out of town and getting away and finding that. It really is the sort of the American dream. So they, they both have this sense of the American dream and yet the, the failure of that. They're not mm. naive to the, to the ways in which that remains a distant kind of dream. Yeah, because some, I mean, one of the things that Bruce Springsteen has been uh, in the news for lately, I mean, we won't touch on the, I think he was arrested for... Oh, well, <laughs> you, you, he, but had, he I'm was more slightly thinking, over the limit okay. with um, the driving a motorbike. <laughs> Simon <laughs> coming to Bruce I'm, Springsteen's I'm defence. Um, but what I was thinking of was he was in a Super Bowl ad um, which I can't actually remember what the ad was for, some kind of truck or something. Um, it was kind of a let's come together as Americans and start listening to each other vibe. Is that kind of what they wanted to talk about was yes. the divisions that are going on and how do you I think they're both a bit this? dismayed. by more. I think they were more hopeful. It makes sense, right? There was that moment early on in when Obama was – coming towards the, the presidency. And so Springsteen saw this as a great moment. And yet they feel a bit slightly disillusioned, as many of us are now. Uh, so it's, they're reflecting on a lot of that. Um, but surely race figures as well. Like, how do they, how do they talk about yes. that? Well, it's a big part of this podcast, at least in the early episodes. They've only released a few, and it's coming out more and more. Um, race is a big part of that. And Springsteen, again, is an interesting character in terms of this. So... Very early on in his career, his one of his first bands was half black people, half white people, which at that time was very unusual. It was much more siloed, even in that music scene. He had a 45-year best friendship with Clarence Clements, who's his saxophone player, who's this enormous, literally enormous character, in it, but in every way. And so they were they were super close friends. And so his him reflecting on that relationship and the things that. Clarence Clemens had to wrestle with and and deal with that are not always obvious to people unless they've sort of had that relationship. And then, of course, Obama's got his stories of of race and growing up in Hawaii and being very different to to all the people around him and what that was like. So they both felt like outsiders, strangely. Mm. I actually, as with (laughs) a lot of things, the first thing I heard about this podcast was indirectly through a joke tweet that someone (laughs) put out, which was Ruth Graham, who's a religion reporter, and she tweeted, I too sat down with my good friend Bruce Springsteen for a long and meaningful conversation that touched on so much of what we're all dealing with these days, but we decided to keep it just between us. (laughs) (laughs) They've got something to say. Most people are going to listen to this. Absolutely. I mean, these two kind of iconic figures. Does it feel like two friends having a chat? How... It does. I mean, obviously, it'd be it's produced and all that, but yeah, it actually does. Mm. And it's not um, super smooth. Like they interrupt each other. They sort of, you know, it's it's very good. And when it when it comes to the race stuff, um, there's a moment where Springsteen talks about this, and he's forever plumbing the sort of American dream and where it's been successful, where it's where it's failed, and, and obviously in race, 
is a huge part of this. And he says, we have to admit that a big, I'm quoting this now, but a big part of our history has been plunderous and violent and rigged against people of colour. And we're ashamed of our collective guilt. And we'd have to admit and grieve what's been done. He's, he's going on about how we have, this is a wound that we haven't faced properly. And we're, until we do, we're going to have major problems. And Obama obviously has a lot to say about that. And they get into this conversation. Obama talks about um, when he was young, he's got a good friend who, who was a white guy. They used to play basketball together. And they got into a bit of an argument and his friend called him this horrible racist term. And Obama punched him in the face when he did that. And he's saying, don't call me that. Don't, ever, don't you ever do that again. And the guy's kind of confused and what's going on there. But he explains what that was like. And he says... It's almost like when people do that, they can say to themselves, I might be poor, I could be ignorant, I could be a mean person, I might not even like myself, but I can say, at least I'm not you. Oh, and it was wow. a quite a stunning kind of moment. And he, he says that the worst part of that is when it comes from people you don't expect it from. Mm. He said, you've got the clan and he goes, okay, we know what that is and we can... That's terrible and horrible and you can understand what it is though. But when someone you don't expect it from mm. uses it, they pull that card out of their back pocket. He says mm. that is absolutely devastating. And Springsteen talks about a moment where that happened to Clarence Clements and how shocking it was and how sort of dehumanizing and, and heartbreaking it was. So they, they, there's some great conversations about this. Springsteen eventually says that... Um, He's been reading James Baldwin. I think lots of people are at the moment after the George Floyd killing. And he has this point where he talks about what Baldwin said, that white people in this country have had quite enough to do in learning how to accept and love themselves and each other. And when they've achieved this, which will not be tomorrow and maybe never, the race problem will no longer exist because it won't be needed. So it's this sense of racism coming from a, a deep insecurity in mm. yourself, which I thought was an interesting Well, that thing. people do harm out of yes. their own pain and messed upness. Yes. And, but, I mean, that almost sounds like, I mean, obviously James Baldwin doesn't mean it this way, but an excuse like a, oh, we need to work on ourselves rather than engage with. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like trying to detect yeah. the depth of the problem. Where's it coming from? Mm. Once you no longer hate yourself. Maybe there's a place to go with that. And so hard because you, policy can only do so much, right? Like yeah. it can't, it can put the structure in place, but it can't change the heart. No, and it was important to recognise, and it was really obvious that both of these men, despite their uh, fears about where things have been going in recent times, they're big believers in the concept of grace. I think that's evident in Springsteen's music. It's evident in Obama's writing and speeches and all that sort of stuff. So this conversation is scattered with bits of music that I enjoy. Now, and occasionally mm. Springsteen actually picks up his guitar Aww, and a plays treat. a short little <laughs> grab. And you can tell Obama's you know, loving that. It's, it's fun. <laughs> You've been listening to Life and Faith with me, Simon Smart, Natasha Moore, and Justine Toe. Today we've been talking about the book Priest Daddy by Patricia Lockwood. It's a 2017 memoir. Also, The Stand, which is an adaptation of Stephen King's novel. It's on Amazon Prime. And the podcast Renegades, born in the USA. That's a Spotify original. Next week. I think Christians have a lot to bring to the political sphere where there is constantly disappointment, but also constantly the prospect of making life better for people, especially those who have less power than we do. And Christians are called especially to care for those neighbors. So there's a lot Christians could do besides making a lot of noise and waving a lot of flags. <laughs>